Okay, good afternoon. All right, today uh, we're going to talk about another virus story that has been scientifically substantial impact and also has impacted the public uh, as well, and that's H5N1. And um, I have to apologize ahead of time. There's a lot of text here uh, in this. Um, it's going to be a mix of science and policy and politics, as you will see. It's a very interesting story. And I definitely have opinions. I'm going to try <laughs> to keep them to myself for the most part. Now, I won't, Dr. Silverstein. I'm not able to do that. Uh, but I will try to identify an opinion when I give it to you. Right. So this is H5N1. Uh, just to remind you, this is about influenza virus, which we have talked about a great deal in this course. I've shown you a, sch a schematic of the virus particle. It's an RNA virus with a segmented genome. This is going to be important for today. And it has an envelope in which there are glycoproteins embedded. Now here is this bigger picture. It gives you a very nice image of this. This is so beautiful, we have to close the lights to see it. It's a cutaway view of the virion. You can see the RNA in the interior, eight pieces of RNA, the viral envelope. Uh, with three different kinds of viral proteins. Today, the important ones are the hemagglutinin mainly, which attaches to cell receptors, the neuraminidase, which is an enzyme that cleaves off cell receptors as the viruses are being produced from the cell. And then you can see the ion channel, which functions during entry. Now, we know these viruses are classified according to their hemagglutinins. We know of 17 different HA types. One was just discovered recently in bats. Uh, there are nine neuraminidases. Humans are infected by viruses with H1, H2, or 3. These are viruses that transmit among humans and cause epidemics and pandemics in N1 or N2. All the other H's and N's are in a variety of different animals. All of them are in birds of various kinds. So birds appear to be the reservoir uh, for these viruses, and in particular, water birds, aquatic birds, are the reservoirs for all of these different influenza types. Uh, ducks, geese, swans, gulls, terns, surf birds, sandpipers, any bird that hangs out near the water is the natural rev reservoir of all the influenza A viruses that we know of. In birds, the infection is largely a gastrointestinal infection. It's different from people. The virus replicates in the epithelial cells of the GI tract. It's shed in the feces. This is important because the birds spread virus everywhere. As they fly, they contaminate water. It's a very easy method of spread. It does replicate in the respiratory tract of birds, but to a lesser extent than in the GI tract. And in many cases, these infections are asymptomatic. There are no symptoms in the bird, with the exception of H5N1, uh, some strains of H5N1, as you will see. So avian influenza, that is the kind of influenza viruses that infect birds, um, are classified according to their pathogenicity, what kind of disease they cause. And we have the so-called low pathogenicity uh, avian influenza viruses, LPAI. These cause a mild respiratory disease. They do cause a decrease in egg production. So these are of uh, economic consequence if you are raising chickens to make eggs or other birds. And then we have the high pathogenicity HPAI, which are the H5 and the H7 HA subtypes. The other subtypes don't seem to be evolving to high pathogenicity strains. These are lethal in birds, particularly poultry, chickens and turkeys, uh, and many wild birds as well. Some ducks are, are not killed by these, but this, these are quite more virulent than the others. All of these viruses, among all their other properties, have in common a sequence of basic amino acids at the HA cleavage site. So we talked about the hemagglutinin glycoprotein precursor before. Uh, that's the red line shown here at the bottom. It's a, it's a membrane glycoprotein. The HA has to be cleaved right here in order to liberate the N-terminus, which has the fusion peptide in it. If these viruses are not cleaved by proteases, they will not be infectious. This is something we talked about earlier. Uh, the enzyme that cleaves that, the protease, is restricted to the respiratory tract for human strains. The high pathogenicity avian strains have a series of basic amino acids at the cleavage site, which means 
that it can be cleaved by proteases that are found in all tissues. These are called ubiquitous proteases. So these viruses, in principle, could replicate in many different tissues. Because remember, we think the protease cleavage is a major determinant of the tropism uh, of these viruses. This is a list of high pathogenicity avian influenza outbreaks since the 50s, just to give you an idea of what these outbreaks can do. Uh, they started in Scotland in 19... 59 with H5N1 in chicken flocks and then you can see as we move on the last number in these virus isolates is the year that they were isolated in the 60s and 70s you can see many turkeys breeder turkeys chickens of big numbers uh, these tend to infect commercial farms that raise birds of various sort for food and these are devastating because not only do they kill a lot of the birds but the whole flock has to be killed in order to spread uh, the, the uh, stop the spread of the infection. So culling is what is done to restrict these outbreaks. There was a big one in Pennsylvania in 1983. Uh, 17 million birds had to be killed to stop that outbreak. You can see one here in Ireland in 1983. And mainly uh, affecting um, domestic birds, but you can see there's some wild birds here as well. Now, the one that's of significance to us is here in 1997. And by the way, you can see there's not just H5s, but H7s uh, as well, causing these high pathogenicity outbreaks. Uh, they continue um, in a variety of countries. Until 1997, there's an outbreak in Hong Kong in chickens, one and a half million chickens and other domestic birds. Um, and this was the first time that these viruses infected and killed people. So we'll focus on that uh, a bit. So the first high pathogenicity outbreak of H5N1 was in 1997 in Hong Kong. Uh, and this was a reassortant virus. It was a new virus, not like any others that had been circulating up until that time. It was a mixture of influenza viruses that infected various kinds of birds. Uh, and as I said, it affected a lot of chickens in Hong Kong. They had to be culled in order to stop the outbreak. And it was the first time that people had died of avian influenza. 18 people were infected in Hong Kong. Six of them died. So at the time, mass slaughter of poultry was done to eliminate uh, the spread of the virus. There was some vaccines developed subsequently and used. And this virus was basically disappeared for a number of years. It reappeared in poultry and in wild birds in 2001. Uh, in 2002. Eventually, uh, this virus, this high pathogenicity H5N1 that emerged in Hong Kong in 1997, this became endemic in poultry throughout uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, in 2005, a new reassortant emerged uh, in China that started to kill wild birds. So up until now, the outbreaks of this virus are confined to domestic poultry. Now we have one uh, infecting wild birds, and at that point the virus began to spread uh, beyond Asia. And sh shortly before this, uh, human infections returned again, as we'll see. The virus within 10 years moved uh, from Asia to Europe and Africa. Uh, it is spread by migratory birds, so again these H5, the high pathogenicity that emerged in the flocks in Hong Kong, uh, eventually are spread by birds and humans also spread the infection they transport illegal birds of various sorts or legal chickens they spread the virus uh, even cats can be infected with these H5N1s in Thai zoos it's been shown that feeding uh, the zoo cats infected chickens infects the the cats because the chickens have H5N1 so we're not sure why these viruses emerged some people speculate that it was the large numbers of poultry being raised that was the selective force, and it, these viruses emerged in them. But they could also have emerged in wild birds. So remember, it's a reassortant back in 1997, which led to the emergence of this virus. That could have been selected for in wild birds as well as in domestic poultry. Certainly now, domestic poultry farms are huge targets for these viruses. There are lots of um, non-immune birds there. And so introduction of these viruses into those situations is lethal. And it's very easy for this to happen because these are typically open areas with the animals uh, outside. 
Uh, wild birds can easily have access to them or to their water supply, and it's very easy for the viruses to get into these communities. So this is, again, agriculturally devastating because you have to cull all of your chickens if you get an infection. Now, in people, um, H5N1 influenza is pretty rare compared to other kinds of influenza. Uh, but its symptoms are quite distinct. It has a very aggressive clinical course in people. There's most often lower respiratory tract involvement, alveoli, which is not always the case with typical human uh, influenza. You, you often have respiratory distress and gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain. We're not quite sure why this occurs, whether it's secondary to cytokines being produced, uh, in some cases, these viruses can be shed in the GI tract, which might be expected because in birds they certainly can't pass through the GI tract. People who are at risk for getting uh, avian influenza are people who handle birds of various sorts. So if you are handling chickens, slaughtering them, taking feathers off, uh, preparing killed poultry for any reason, whether this be in a meat market or on a farm, you're at risk. And most of the cases are associated with people who are handling poultry, but not all of them. There's not always an association with poultry. Um, but there is no spread from person to person, so it's not clear uh, how these cases have emerged. So it's been declared that these H5N1 avian influenza viruses have pandemic potential. They're endemic in poultry in many parts of the world. I'll show you a map in a moment. Um, the, and they're endemic in large numbers. There's no immunity in people, so they don't infect most of us, so we don't have antibodies against them. And our previous experience with uh, influenza doesn't help us be immune. There's no cross-reactivity. So many governments, WHO, CDC, have decided that this virus is, is serious and that we have to prepare. So a lot of money is being uh, spent on surveillance, looking at animals throughout the world, sequencing isolates and seeing what's going on, preparation of vaccines. And this is tricky because, as you know, the virus does vary. So we could stockpile a vaccine today, and in a year it might not be useful. It might be against the wrong variant. And stockpiling uh, antivirals. So a lot, a lot of money has gone into this in many different countries. Uh, this is a map which is a bit old, but it gives you an idea of the extent of uh, H5N1 uh, in birds and uh, in humans. So the darker yellow is H5N1 in poultry and wild birds. So you can see it has spread from its initial beginnings in Hong Kong throughout uh, to Europe and, and Africa as well. And in humans, you can see most of the cases are in here as well. It has spared the Western Hemisphere so far. We're not really sure uh, why that is. Um, and this is the summary of the documented cases of H5N1 in people. And this is World Health Organization documented cases. There have been 601 cases. This is the current number. I picked this up last night on the WHO website. The map is uh, March 2011. So the numbers are not going to add up. But you can see where the majority of the cases are in red uh, throughout Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, quite a few in Egypt and other parts of uh, Africa. Again, no, no deaths yet in Europe. So there's 601 cases, 354 deaths. And this is, again, certified by WHO. Now, if you, if you read the news at all, you know that every time someone dies of H5N1, it is reported in the press. Now, this is a small number. We don't want anyone to die. But 600 cases is nothing because there are millions and millions of cases every year. And in the US, 3,000 to 40,000 people can die of seasonal flu. So this, for some reason, gets additional attention. And you'll see why as we go through this story. So here is the WHO case definition for H5N1 influenza. This is very important. So WHO says you have a case of H5 if you have an acute febrile respiratory illness. You have known H5 exposure in the preceding seven days before you got sick. 
known risk for, for being exposed to H5 on a chicken farm or handling chickens in a market or being near someone who had a chicken, sleeping with a chicken in your room. This happens all the time. Um, so don't do that. It's a risk factor. Um, molecular confirmation of H5 by WHO, uh, by a WHO approved lab. So this means PCR or culturing the virus in cells. Um, this is a big problem because in most parts of the world where this virus is endemic, um, you don't have very good health care and if you get sick you're lucky you can get to a hospital and if you do it probably doesn't have a lab that's accredited by WHO for isolating H5N1. So the likelihood is that we miss a lot of asymptomatic infections or even serious ones that don't go to the right place. So this is a very restrictive definition. So again, in areas with poor health care, where most, most H5 cases occur, it's likely we're missing a lot of these. And if they're mild, nobody goes to get health care anyway. So we have really no estimate of uh, really how many people are infected with this virus. Now here is the beginning of the problem here. If you take the numbers which I just showed you, the, the number of deaths over the number of WHO confirmed cases, you come up with a case fatality ratio of 59%, which is huge. It is bigger than any other kind of influenza. So the worst flu outbreak was 1918. The case fatality ratio was about 2%. Seasonal flu is 0.1 to 0.2% fatality. This is the fear factor with H5. This is why people freak out about this virus because they say, ah, it's 50 to 60 percent fatal. If it ever gets out of birds and into people and spreads among people, it's going to kill half the world, right? Well, the actual rate, as I said, is probably much, much lower than this uh, for many reasons. One of them is that, as I said, we probably don't even know how many people are infected. And we, the denominator is the important number here. I mean, if this is orders of magnitudes bigger, and it likely is because the WHO isn't the only organization that, that can uh, detect H5 infections, then it's going to be much lower. Yes? Um, what motivation would the WHO have to cause this panic and overestimate? <laughs> well, they don't do it on their own. The, um, I think the, I'm going to blame the press in part for, for generating it. So. Uh, if you read articles about uh, avian flu, they always cite this number in the first sentence of the story. In fact, in the past six months when this has been written about a lot, avian influenza mortality rate is 60%, and therefore we have to worry about it. So, you know, WHO puts the numbers out there because that's what they have, but I don't, I don't think they do it on purpose. Now, some people might trump this or trumpet this number as a way of getting research money. Okay? And there are many virologists who have done this, um, say, saying, this is a terrible virus. We have to be careful. You need to give me money to work on it. Um, and I do think this happens, and it's unfortunate. When you yes, sir? When you say the rate's lower, you're saying there may be asymptomatic infection? What I'm saying or is that we're not picking up all of the cases of H5 infection globally. Okay, this is just the ones that are reported to WHO, they're hospitalized, they are confirmed by a WHO associated lab. So there are far more case infections than this. Yes? I know that it's more likely that there's going to be non-lethal infections that aren't reported, but isn't it also possible that there are, are some lethal infections that aren't reported, especially in areas with... Sure, absolutely. I, I agree. It could be both lethal and non-lethal infections. We really don't know the number. So for everyone to quote a fatality rate of 50 to 60 percent is simply wrong. Okay, that's the point. But let me show you some evidence for more infections. So over the years, a number of studies have been done in, in various countries at risk for H5 infection where they take uh, people's serum and they say, are there antibodies to H5N1 viruses in, in your blood? And uh, when this controversy erupted in, at the end of 2011, as I said, every newspaper was quoting a 60% fatality rate. Peter Palazzi over at Mount Sinai uh, found this to be absurd. So he went into the literature 
uh, with Taya Wong, a, an MD PhD student in his lab. And they said, let's get all of the studies which look for uh, antibodies to H5 in people and make a meta-analysis. That is, we're going to look at all the data and come to conclusions. And you can see this was published in Science um, not too long ago. The prevalence of avian uh, influenza A infections in humans has not been definitively determined. We hypothesize that the stringent criteria for confirmation of a human case does not account for a majority of infections, but rather the select few cases that are more likely to be severe and result in poor clinical outcome. Meta-analysis shows that 1 to 2 percent of more than 12,500 study participants from 20 studies had sero evidence for H5N1 infection. So this is just pooling all the data from 20 different studies. 1 to 2 percent seropositivity. So just think about that number. If millions of people are at risk in, in Asia, for example, where we know people to be at risk, this could raise that denominator substantially. Could bring it from 50 to 10 or less than 10 percent fatality rate. So it really is not serving anyone good to use that number until we get this. Now many people have criticized all of these studies. They, as you will see mo in moments, there's the scientists who do the research and now growing in the world is another group of individuals who are risk assessors and policy developers. And these are people who develop ways to respond to various problems like a pandemic, an earthquake or whatever. Um, but in, the, in this case particularly, um, their job is to make sure we're ready for a pandemic of whatever sort. So they discount these numbers. They say that all the studies are garbage and they didn't use the right methodology and so forth. So at some point someone needs to go and get lots of samples and collect them in a way that satisfies everyone and answer the question definitively. So let's look at these numbers in another way. Um, these are numbers from the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. All right. These are CDC numbers. You can find this on their website. So there were, in a one-year period, is April to April 29 to 2010, 12,469 deaths from this virus in the U.S. And I can tell you very few of these were reported in the press. And, that, and along with that, they estimate 274,000 hospitalizations. So if we take the WHO H5 route, we divide 12,000 by 274,000, we get a fatality rate of 4.5%, which is way too high for seasonal influenza. And that's because we're using hospitalization as the denominator. Let's take it another way. Let's take the 12,000 deaths and divide by the, known, the estimate for the known cases, total known cases of H1N1 flu in the US, which is about 61 million. Okay, so TDC, this is an estimate based on sampling throughout the country, so it could be wrong. But if you do that, then you get 0.02% case fatality rate, which is much lower. So the difference here is just by using a different denominator. So I think the reason I'm telling you this is because a lot of the fear over H5 is based on this 50% mortality rate, which simply isn't correct. And if you hear this, and you will hear it going out, into the world, it's just remember, it's not right. Just be critical of it, because until we have the denominator, we don't know what that is. Now, very recently, a new study came out, uh, which was done, again, to look for uh, people who have been infected with H5 viruses but didn't get very sick. This was a study done in a high-risk Vietnamese cohort. So these viruses are endemic in Vietnam. And there are people, high risk means you live in an area where there have been known H5 cases. So they collected, I think, about 800 uh, case, uh, individuals for this study. And what they did was they collected uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from these individuals. So you take blood and you purify the white blood cells. Uh, and then they asked, so among those white blood cells, there are T cells. And as you know, T cells can specifically recognize viral peptides when presented to them uh, by an antigen-presenting cell, like a dendritic cell or a macrophage. So what they do is they make these PBMCs from patients, they culture them, and then they add peptides for, from various influenza viruses. They added H5, H1, H2 peptides from the whole viral genome. They make dozens and dozens of peptides, just throw them into culture. Now, when a T cell recognizes a peptide that it knows about, so remember each T cell is specific for a peptide, here's the T cell 
It's got a T cell receptor that will recognize the peptide when it's presented to it in the context of an MHC molecule on another cell. When the T cell sees that peptide, it says, aha, this is my peptide, it starts to get activated. And among other things, it makes interferon gamma. So you can easily measure interferon gamma production in these cultures. All right, so that's what they did. They got these cultures from 800 people of, of peripheral blood cells. They throw in peptides, and they measure interferon gamma. Um, and 20% of the patients respond to H5 peptides, 20% of 800. And these people have not been sick, so they do medical histories and make sure they haven't had any kind of serious illness. So these are people that probably had mild infections as well. This is an independent method for assessing immunity to H5. So if you don't like the serology, well, this is totally different. This is looking for cellular immunity against H5. So they can't both be wrong. All right, so how much should we worry about H5N1? As I said, we're spending a lot of money on this. It's endemic in poultry. The case fatality issue has driven uh, fright, and so as a consequence, we're investing a lot of money in this. It doesn't transmit among humans. Every case that we see, those 600 cases, are, are dead-end infections. It doesn't go to anyone else. Okay, so if you hug a chicken and you inhale, it's virus that it's, it, that it's excreting deep into your lungs and you get H5N1, uh, you are not going to transmit it to anyone else. Only H1, H2, and H3 human viruses can do this, transmit from human to human. So who knows if the virus will ever acquire the ability to transmit among people. It obviously needs mutations to do that, right? We know viruses mutate extensively. We've talked about that here uh, in this course. Uh, and probably out there, there are viruses with the right mutations, but who knows if they'll ever go into people. Nobody can predict it. If someone says it's going to happen, they're wrong because you just don't know. If someone says it's not going to happen, they would be wrong too. You just have no clue uh, whether that will happen or not. So how much money should you spend? So this is a risk-benefit calculation. And as I said, there are individuals who do this for a living. They are risk assessors and they decided that we, the risk of H5 is sufficient that we should be monitoring it. I, I think it's probably a good idea to monitor not this, not just this, but other avian influenza viruses because any of them have the ability to jump into humans at one point. But H5 is getting all the money and all the attention. Here's some other examples of other avian uh, influenza virus strains that have infected people. Uh, H9N2 viruses infected pigs and humans in 1998 going from birds. It wasn't fatal, but there were documented infections. Uh, in 2003, there was an outbreak of H7N7 in poultry in the Netherlands. And in this outbreak, uh, 89 humans were infected. And there was documented human-to-human -human, uh, transmission. 2004, two people infected uh, with H7N3 after an outbreak in Canada. So there are other viruses out there. So if we're going to do surveillance, we have to look at all of them. So then you have to decide at what point do you, how much of your resources, where our resources are limited. We have lots of other science we can do. We, can, we have other things besides science too, obviously. How much are you going to put into this uh, problem before you start compromising your ability to make progress in cancer or heart disease or, or other diseases as well. This is a tough question. I don't have an answer for you, but I think that's an important consideration. Yes? I'm confused by the second one. I thought only H1, H2, or H3 would do human to human transmission, but this is an H7. So this is the only outbreak where the H7s went from, from human to human. That's seen since then. But it just shows you that, well, we are ignoring these other viruses, which may have greater potential for, for going to human to human. Anyway, so that's a very interesting question that people wrestle with all the time. My for you is that you have to balance your research portfolio. You can't put all your money into one thing, obviously. So you have to decide what's enough for H5 compared to others. Now, a big reason why um, there isn't more of an H5 problem in people is the receptors. So you remember that the hemagglutinin of the virus recognizes sialic acid receptors uh, on the host cell. Uh, human and avian strains recognize different kinds of sialic acids. So human strains recognize alpha-2-6 linked sialic acids, which would, here's the alpha-2 on the sialic acid. Uh, this would be the 6. So that linkage would be for human viruses. 
Avian strains pref prefer to bind sialic acids linked in an alpha 2, 3 configuration, as you can see here. So sialic acid is what the HA binds. The second sugar, the way it's linked, controls uh, the specificity. So the strains that uh, infect people are typically all alpha 2, 6 preferers. We have plenty of alpha 2, 6 sialic acids throughout our upper and lower tract. We don't have any alpha 2, 3 in the upper tract, or very little. We have more in the lower tract. So the idea is when people get infected by avian strains, the virus has to go deep into your lungs in order to infect you. Because if you just take them in the upper tract, they probably won't take hold. But that's speculation. We're not sure. So why don't H5N1 influenza viruses transmit among humans? This is the big question. Uh, if we knew the answer, we probably wouldn't be so scared about pandemic potential. Of course, to know the answer to this, you need an animal model. And people use various animal models for flu, but the one that is probably the best, in quotes, which doesn't mean it's people, it just means it's the best we have, is the ferret here. So that's a, that's a sneezing or coughing ferret. Ferrets, when you infect them intranasally with flu, it multiplies in them depending on the strain. They get flu-like symptoms. They cough and sneeze. They have nasal structures very much like that of, of people. You've heard people call each other ferrets. Well, this is where it comes from, of course. Um, and they make an immune response to infection. So it's a great model. But I just want to emphasize that it is not predictive. No animal model is predictive of what happens in people. People assume that that's the case. And you will read in the press, and I will show you a quote later of someone saying if it's a good model, if the scientists say it's a good model, then it must be the same as people, right? No, it's not. It's something we need to use to work on, but it, it doesn't mimic everything. For example, uh, often when you infect ferrets, the virus goes into the brain of the ferret. It doesn't happen in human flu, so it's not a perfect model. Who knows why? Probably when you spray the virus into the nose of the ferret, you know, there are olfactory receptors up there, and you're probably forcing the virus up into the brain in some way. So very different from human. All right, so that's our preferred animal model. There are others. There are guinea pigs. Uh, there are mice, even non-human primates. But I tell you, if you use a non-human primate, it's also a lousy model for flu because you have to put the virus intratracheally into those animals. So no animal is perfect. Um, now, in these animals, they all have alpha-2,6 sialic acids in them, so they're very much mammals like, like we are. Uh, if you change alpha, uh, H5N1 virus so that it now recognizes just alpha-2,6 sialic acid, you can do that. We know the amino acid changes in the hemagglutinin to make to get these H5 viruses to recognize uh, alpha-2,6. That is not enough to get transmission in a ferret model. All right? So you can do transmission experiments. You take a cage of ferrets, and then you put another cage next to it, a few feet away. These are wire cages, so the air can go through. You infect this ferret, they cough and they sneeze, and the next one will get infected. It's very easy to do these experiments. It's expensive, but it can be done. So if you change the receptor specificity to make them bind alpha-2,6, it's not enough to get transmission among ferrets. The other uh, consideration is that even if you change the hemagglutinin so it matches uh, alpha 2,6. Let's say you take an H5N1 virus. You change the H5H, say, you can make two amino acid changes so it will now recognize alpha 2,6 receptors. The neuraminidase is not matching. Remember, the neuraminidase functions by cleaving off sialic acids from the cell as the virus is leaving. You've, if you just take H5N1 and change the HA, you now have a, a, an avian N1 there, and it's not going to be able to recognize the alpha-2,6 well to, to cleave off and allow the virus to leave. So you have to probably change that as well. In addition, people have shown that the avian RNA polymerase, or the, I should say the RNA polymerase of these avian strains doesn't, rep, doesn't work very well in mammalian cells. And so you need a couple of amino acid changes there to get better replication. So there are lots of determinants of, of transmission, most likely. OK, so this is where our story really begins from the past six months. And these are two of the people who have been involved. This is uh, Yoshihiro Kawaoka here on the left, who's at the, uh, well, he has two labs. He has one at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he spends two weeks. And then after the two weeks, he goes to Tokyo, where he has another lab. And he spends two weeks here. And he goes back and forth every two weeks. He's got more miles than anybody I know of. 
So he is a very good flu researcher. And here is Ron Fouchier, who uh, is at the Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam. Okay, so these um, two individuals have done some work that addresses why these viruses don't transmit. They use a ferret model, and uh, this is what caused the storm in the last six months. So back in November, just before Thanksgiving, an article came out in Science Insider, the, the title, Scientists Brace for Media Storm Around Controversial Flu Studies. So this is the first that I had heard about this. Uh, locked up in the bowels of the medical faculty building here and accessible to only a handful of scientists lies a man-made virus that could change world history if it were ever set free. It's just... <laughs> They're not, they're not your news. Science, science. This is a science. journal. This is a science journal that has this Deep kind of research. stuff in it. So the virus is an H5N1 avian strain that has been genetically altered and is now easily transmissible between ferrets. Scientists believe it's likely that the pathogen, if it emerged or were released, would trigger an influenza pandemic, quite possibly with many millions of deaths. I don't know who he talked to, but I don't believe that this is true at all. Okay, so Ron Fouchier here, look, Ron says it's probably one of the most dangerous viruses you can make. Okay, so he's really helping the case here. He's fanning the fuel right on. What else do I want to show you here? Okay, so then they talk about the Kawaoka experiments. He did similar uh, work, but we didn't hear the details as we did here. So what did uh, Fouchier do? By the way, so this was an incredibly inflammatory article that got the press going. Because here's Fouchier saying this is incredibly dangerous virus. It could kill half the world. I really think he could have moderated himself at this early point. Now, uh, the U.S. has a committee called the NSABB. And we're going to talk about it in a moment. The chair of that committee, whose, whose job is to look for dangerous experiments, essentially, is Paul Keim. He's a microbiologist at the University of Arizona. He was quoted in the article saying, I can't think of another pathogenic organism as scary as this one. I don't think anthrax is scary at all. Richard Ebright, who is a molecular biologist over at Rutgers, works on RNA polymerase in E. coli, he said this work should never have been done. So what did Fouchier do? It turns out that his experiments, he had presented at a meeting in Malta in September of 2011. There were about 600 scientists there. So all those people knew the details of what went on. He introduced three amino acid changes into a wild isolate of H5N1 to allow it to adapt to mammals. Now, Fouché would not tell anyone outside of that meeting what these changes were because he was told not to, as you will see in a moment. So we don't know what these changes are. I would suggest some of them have to be to make it bind alpha-2,6 sialic acids, but what else might be there, I don't know. Uh, that virus does not transmit among ferrets in the air. So then what he did, he passed it manually from ferret to ferret. He would put the virus in the nose, let the ferrets incubate for a while, do a nasal wash, and take that virus and infect new ferrets. So he calls this a really, really stupid project. Another really nice thing to say on his part. At the end of 10 passages, that virus was now able to transmit through the air among ferrets. So you infect the ferret, and then the ferret in the neighboring cage will get infected without any contact. Okay, so then you, know, you have to look in that virus and see what kinds of mutations are causing this phenotype. Now back um, it, at this time, at the end of 2011, there was an article in New Scientist. All right, this is an online journal. Uh, five easy mutations to make bird flu a lethal pandemic. So now the press is getting involved here. And this is... Um, the bird flu can kill humans but has not gone pandemic because it cannot spread. That might change. Five mutations and two genes have allowed the virus to spread between mammals in the lab. So now we have five mutations apparently that are involved here. We don't know what they are. What's more, the virus is just as lethal despite the mutation. So remember that, okay? We're going to come back to that later. later. Uh, and Fouché says it's transmitted as efficiently as seasonal flu. Keep, keep that in your mind as well. This shows clearly that H5 can change in a way that allows transmission and still cause severe disease in humans. Have you seen a human experiment here? Right? I haven't seen any. So I, why is Peter Doherty, who got a Nobel Prize, saying that it can spread in humans? So this is a problem when scientists talk to the press. 
All right, so here we go. They took a virus and spread it 10 times from ferret to ferret. The 10th round shed an H5N1 strain that spread to ferrets in separate cages and killed them. All right, that's the same as what I'm telling you up here. Hold on to that. It spread from ferret to ferret and that killed them. All right, so then he said he picked out the mutations and says five are required to make the virus airborne. But we don't know what these mutations are and today I don't e know either because the paper hasn't been published. So it has to wait till next year's course, unfortunately. But we have some other things we can talk about. All right, so this brings in the NSABB, the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. This is a federal committee which job is to oversee, oversee dual use research. Dual use research is research that you would do which has a good purpose but which could be uh, misused by someone else to make a bioweapon, for example. So you can read all about that down here. That's what the NSABB is. It was convened shortly after 9-11 in the anthrax attacks to deal with biowarfare. Uh, it con it's composed of a variety of experts, Paul Keim, Richard Ebright, a bunch of virologists. Um, you can see here all the different areas. We have biosafety, public health people, vets, national security, biodefense, law enforcement. I wouldn't want to be on this committee. I can't imagine them ever making a decision. Too many different <laughs> interests. Anyway, what happens is when you submit a paper for publication, most of the journals have a form and there's a little box that says, check this box if the experiments you've done might be a cause of concern for the NSABB, all right, dual use. And so then the journal decides whether to send it to the NSABB. And Honor then, system. sorry? Honor system. I think so. I think, I think it's an honor system. There's no, the NSCBB has no uh, power whatsoever to enforce no, anything. Uh, no, it's just that the journal has to decide whether they will send it or not. And so in this case, the Fouché and the Kawaoka manuscripts uh, w went to the NSABB and they decided that it shouldn't be published. All right. By the way, we're going to have a member of the NSABB on TWIB this Friday. So after you've done the final, you know, and you want to listen to something interesting, check that out. All right, so the NSABB, this is a little blurb on dual use research. So basically, this is part of the charter. They're saying here that research is good, life science research is good, but sometimes it can be misapplied to create dangerous pathogens for employment as weapons, and that's what dual use research is. And this is inherent in, in a lot of what we do. A lot of the work we do is dangerous. But if some things are really dangerous, we call that dual use research of concern. And that's where the H5N1 research falls under. So um, they look at these uh, issues in, in past judgment. So on December 20th, uh, NSABB said you can't publish this. And Fouché and Kawaoka said, OK, we will take out details and publish what's left. We'll take out the methods, and we'll take out the results, and we'll publish what's left from that. And that's why I say this is a bad day for science. Because what is left to publish if you take out the methods and the results? You're going to just say, I infected ferrets and I got a virulent virus out? Who cares about that? It's not a paper. A paper, as you know, is something that enables someone else to do the experiment. So this is not a scientific paper any longer. So these, uh, two, these two guys agreed to remove details. It's called redaction. So this word permeated the influenza lexicon subsequent to this. Um, and then the journal said, and the NSABB said, we'll give the details to those people who need them. We'll give them to influenza people who are working on H5 and who else, whoever else needs them. And this really rankled me because in science, so much depends on serendipity. So someone will read a paper and go, whoa, I, I would love to work on this. I have a great idea. And they end up making the breakthrough. And if you restrict the data to people who you think need it, you're going to get rid of all that. And I think that's the worst thing that you can do for science. So I think this legitimate interest is just nonsense. So the press got involved big time. The New York Times had an editorial on the Sunday editorial page. Unheard of. It's usually reserved for politics and economics. The heading was an engineered doom day. This was January 8, 2012. This Sunday morning, I get my newspaper, I walk to the end of the driveway and I get this and I see an engineered doom day. So, so I immediately wrote a rebuttal which they never published, but uh, <laughs> they, um, this is one of the things they said, the research should never have been done because the potential harm is so catastrophic and the benefits are so speculative 
they created a virus that could kill tens or hundreds of millions of people if it escaped confinement or was stolen. The new virus ought to be destroyed. This is why I teach this course. So if you ever write a Times editorial one day, you won't do the same mistake that they did. This is totally, a totally uninformed opinion. They have no reason to make any of these statements. And clearly the editorial writer is not a scientist and has no science background because these statements are false. We know nothing about the ability of these viruses to do anything in people. What we know about is ferrets, and you can't make any predictions. So the idea is that this virus, or these viruses made by Fuxi and Kaoka, could be used as bioweapons. So the NSABB said, we're not going to release the sequences, because a terrorist could make this virus and use it as a bioweapon, which is absurd, because it, you don't even know if the virus would do anything in people. So that doesn't seem like an effective uh, weapon of terror to me. Uh, but anyway. Um, Next thing that happened was in January, at the end of January, the people working on H5N1 decided they would make a moratorium on research on this virus. So about 20 uh, virologists said, we have agreed on a voluntary pause of 60 days on any research involving highly pathogenic uh, avian flu, leading to the generation of viruses that are transmissible. No experiments with viruses already shown to be uh, transmissible will be conducted. So they, they set this moratorium to see if they could get together and discuss how to move forward, which I thought was not a great idea, because now here are, you have these great data, presumably, which can help you address the problem of transmissibility, and then you can't let anyone work on it, which seems counterproductive. So my view of this is you're letting fear to cloud your ability to do science. And you, the people who would use these viruses if that ever happened are not restrained by your moratorium or by your rules. They can do whatever they want. We're the ones not doing the work, which seems silly to me. Now, a few weeks after that editorial, the New York Times did what they call a Sunday dialogue. So here they, they post something on Sunday, and then you can write letters, and then in the middle of the week they post all the letters. So they actually emailed me and said, you know, we didn't publish your letter, but we'd like you to contribute to this. So the, the, this is a letter from Tom Inglesby. So Tom Inglesby is, a, is an ID physician who is the director of the Center for Biosecurity at the University of Pittsburgh. So this is the growing area of biosecurity. You can go here and get a PhD in biosecurity where you think about ways to prevent bad things from happening, not just re reactions to pandemics, but bioterrorism as well. So uh, Inglesby said, Ferrets are the best model for predicting human flu transmission. So the assumption should be that this new strain would spread among humans, which of course is completely wrong. But I suspect either he doesn't understand it, or if he does, he's using it as a way to make his point. Because after all, this is his job to do this policy stuff. And if there's nothing to do, well, then he doesn't have a job. <laughs> this is the opinion part of it. This is my opinion, <laughs> because this is, so, this is so wrong. I just cannot believe that an ID physician would say something like this. Do you think, Dr. Silverstein, that an ID physician would say this? As I said, the ferret is a model, and it's not predictive. Anyway, you can read the rest, you can read the rest of his. I've put it all here for you. And here's the link to all these letters. My letter is in there, too, where I said he was wrong. But then he was able to respond to me and said that I was wrong. So, you know, this, <laughs> nothing gets learned. But anyway, there's some good letters on both sides in there. You should take a look at them. WHO had a meeting in February. They said, we have to publish this. Now, this is very interesting because as all this is going on, so think of what's happening here. The US is deciding what the rest of the world is gonna do. Do you know how that rankles the rest of the world? <laughs> incredibly, <laughs> incredibly. And uh, I, I would go to Europe and people would say, who cares what you guys think? I, we wanna do what we want. So WHO, they meet in Geneva. They basically shoved it to the United States and they say, you gotta publish these papers. We don't wanna listen to, they didn't say we don't wanna listen to what you do, what you want, but they decided that the paper should be published. They say, um, we should disclose this information. We understand there are concerns. Let's figure out how to communicate to the public why this is not an issue and uh, review biosafety and security and then we'll publish it. So that was really good. I thought that was a good day. Now, um, not too long after that, Fouché came to Washington, D.C. and gave a talk at, the, at an ASM biodefense conference. And this was videotaped and put online. And I did a capture of... Um, 
this, and I, and I took a couple of slides from it. And here he starts to really talk about what he did. These, these slides are a little uh, messed up, but you can get the answer. So first of all, he took wild type H5N1 and his mutated H5N1. This is the one with five amino acid changes. We don't know where they are. And he puts them in the nose of ferrets. So here are your ferrets here and here, right? So in this ferret, the, the wild type virus replicates. These are virus titers in the respiratory tract. And then in the next cage is another uh, uninfected ferret. This ferret never gets infected. So this virus does not transmit. It's the wild type H5N1. Same thing as in people, I guess. Then he takes his mutated H5. He infects a ferret. And then the ferret in the next cage, three out of four of those get infected by aerosol. And then if he takes this virus and puts it in another ferret, then that ferret transmits it to two out of two other ferrets. Okay, so he does this 10 times, and he can show adaptation to airborne transmission. So that's his e experiment. We don't know what the mutations are, but this is what he did. All right, the next slide he shows it's not lethal. Remember I pointed out to you earlier these viruses are transmissible and lethal? Now Fouché is getting up and saying these are not lethal. When, you, um, when it's transmitted by aerosol, it doesn't kill the ferrets. So here is intranasal inoculation. Uh, wild type kills both animals. You put it in the nose, wild type H5 kills them. If you put the mutated H5, look, only one out of eight are killed. So you've already attenuated this virus by passing it in ferrets. Uh, then you do an aerosol experiment. Uh, that is, you ask whether transmission by aerosol of the mutated virus leads to death and that's zero out of seven. So none of the ferrets who acquire this mutated virus by aerosol get sick or they don't die. They probably get sick, but they don't die. If you put the virus intratracheally uh, into ferrets, we'll put a tube all the way down into the trachea and put the virus there, then it will kill them. And that is what Fouché meant when he said it was lethal. But the press just picked up lethal. They forgot about how they were inoculated. They assumed it was going through the air and being lethal. And such was the misunderstanding. He also showed that if you immunize these ferrets with the 2009 pandemic H1N1 vaccine, they are protected against H5N1 infection, which is really strange because they are to two totally different H5s, so we don't understand the basis for that. March 30th, the NSABB reversed its decision. They said, on further examination, we've decided that we can publish these data. Uh, after careful deliberation, we unanimously recommended that the Kaioka manuscript should be published and 12 to 6, the Fouchier manuscript should be published. And they said that the revised manuscripts had more information that showed to them it do not appear to provide information that would immediately enable misuse of the research. Now, this is one reason I want to have one of these members on TWIV Friday. I don't understand what was different about the manuscripts that made them change their mind. It seems to me that the science was exactly the same. So did they explain it better? And if so, why do you need it to be explained to you? If you are an expert, you should be able to understand it. So we will see what that's all about. I don't understand that. I had Fouché on TWIV in Dublin a couple of weeks ago. Here he is in the middle here. We did a podcast. And I said, what's the difference between your first paper? Why did people say it was lethal and the NSABB didn't take it and then they take it? He said, it's the same data in both papers. Everyone thought it was lethal by aerosol, but I never said it was. He says, when you say something is virulent, you have to tell me how it's inoculated. And if you remember, I told you that way back when, when we were talking about virulence. And I said to him, that's what I told my virology course, that virulence <laughs> doesn't make any sense unless you tell us the root of inoculation. So look what happened. People, the press said it was virulent, but they didn't say only if you put it intratracheally. Now, what the NSABB was thinking, I don't know, because this is a confidential deliberation, and we may not ever learn what happened. But um, you have to always consider the root of inoculation. All right, a couple of other things. Um, uh, back in February, there was a panel at the New York Academy of Sciences, which I participated in. It was called uh, Dual Use Research. And um, it involved a number of individuals on both sides. So this is Michael Osterholm, who's director of, of this Center for Infectious Disease Policy at the University of Minnesota. He is very much in favor of restricting this kind of research. Uh, this is Laurie Garrett, who's a well-known author, who is uh, on the Council of Foreign Relations and is also not in favor of allowing 
this kind of work to go forward. Uh, here's Peter Palazzi, who uh, authored the meta-analysis that I told you about, who was strongly in favor of this going forward. Now, you should watch the video, because at some point, Palazzi is saying, you know, the serology says it's not that lethal, and it's not transmitting, and, and Osterholm says, you don't know what you're talking about, basically. <laughs> and it was it's really uh, an interesting moment. So I don't want to tell you too much more about that. All right, so then, um, not too long ago, Osterholm wrote a letter to the NIH, said, I don't agree with this NSABB decision. I voted to redact the Fouchier paper. Why? Because the agenda was biased. It was designed to produce the outcome. There was no uh, balanced discussion of what was going to go on, a one-sided picture of risk-benefit information. Uh, there was no review to address the wrong people doing reverse genetics, that is, making viruses from DNA. All the people that testified were doing the work, so of course they want it uh, to continue. So he, he was complaining that this wasn't really fair. Uh, he said a lot of researchers say it's easy to make flu in labs, and in particular he quoted, this was his quote, some outspoken researchers have been underrepresenting the increased risk that would be entailed by full publication versus the situation where only the general outline is known. I don't see what, the, what difference this makes at all. You publish this, someone's going to get this information, what are they going to do with it? They're going to make these viruses, so if they could, which is not easy, what would happen if they released them? Probably nothing. They're attenuated in ferrets. Right? One out of eight get it gets, dies when you put it right in the nose. So I don't understand what the, what the point is here whatsoever. He says bad things can happen in labs. This is the theme of his, Laurie Garrett, over and over. Scientists can't be trusted to do experiments because they screw up all the time. He said, for example, in 1977, the pandemic came from a lab in Russia. I don't know if you remember, but way back when we were talking about uh, evolution, I told you about all the series of pandemic influenza strains that have emerged. In 1977, it was essentially an, a strain that had been around in the 50s that emerged almost unchanged from the 50s. So people believe this is a lab accident, but no one has admitted it, and no one is ever going to prove this. But he uses this as an example why scientists can't be left uh, to their own devices. He says he shouldn't have approved the publication of the 1918 influenza virus sequence. So that was reviewed by the NSABB, and the point was made that good research would come of it, so it was approved. And he says, uh, I shouldn't have approved it because someone could have made that virus and released it and it would have caused a pandemic. Well, nobody did. It's really hard to do. And now it doesn't matter anymore because the 2009 H1N1 cross-reacts, so we're all immune to 1918 anyway. So the point here is, do we have to paralyze research for hypothetical fears? That's what all of these are. So you can never predict what is going to happen in science. You can't do a risk-benefit of experiments, because you absolutely don't know what's going to happen. Um, since then, the, yes? There are two, arguments, two, two threads going on here, whether the H5N1 virus publication should have been published, right. and the overarching theme of, should we censor any publication? Right. And I'm confused That's right. by your last side as to your opinion on the latter of the two. Nothing. I understand on yeah. this yes. particular one that should have been published yes. based on the science. Well, I, I have a slide about that at the end. Okay. I'll let you know what I think. Uh, on, uh, it, not too long ago in April, the, the U.S. issued a new policy on dangerous research going forward. They say if you work on any of these agents or toxins, and you do any of these experiments, so here we have uh, smallpox, Yersinia, Rinderpest, Marburg, avian influenza, if you try and make it more transmissible or resistant to therapies or antibodies, we're going to review these experiments before you do them, before you submit the paper for publication, which is probably a good idea. But who's going to review it? What's going to be the committee made of? All people involved in policies? going to be a mix of scientists? I mean, I, I think it's important that we get a fair review of these experiments. And the idea would be to stop them before they go any further. So that's the way it's going to be, and we don't have any any way around that. What about the papers? Kawaoka and Fouché spoke at a Royal Society meeting in April. Uh, Ed Young, who is a science writer in the UK, tweeted the entire conference. And you can go to this link and see everything that they said. Fouché actually didn't say anything, but Kawaoka did. He said he has identified uh, two amino acid changes in the H5HA that allows it to bind to sialic acid receptors. He put these into the 2009 H1N1 virus. So he constructed a resortant all 2009 H1N1 with the H5 of uh, avian influenza virus. And he has two amino acid changes in the H5. 
he infects ferrets, and he selects viruses that can replicate and transmit from one ferret to another. Um, so he has four mutations or amino acid changes in the HA, these positions. These transmit among ferrets, but doesn't kill them. Okay, it's not, not fatal. Um, three of the changes are up in the head at the sialic acid binding position, which allows these viruses to recognize human receptors. Uh, and then one is down here near the fusion peptide. Quite interesting. Uh, and apparently what happens is when you select for viruses that can bind alpha-2,6, you reduce the stability of the HA at lower pHs. And so you then select in ferrets for a mutation down here that makes it more stable at low pH. So it's quite interesting. He showed that um, these viruses can be controlled by current vaccines and antivirals. And this, should, this is going to be published Wednesday. I actually got a copy of this paper this morning, which I can't tell you about because it's embargoed. But Wednesday it'll be out. Fouché could not talk. The Dutch government decided he needed to get an export license to send this information out of the country. So he struggled with them for a while. Uh, on the 27th, uh, he finally applied for a license, and they approved it. You can see the headline here. They okayed the study. Uh, the license is in my inbox. Now we can move on. He had previously opposed to applying for a license initially, which he says is an inappropriate tool to control the flow of scientific information, but eventually he applied because otherwise the paper would never have been published. But this is a weird way to, con to control information. Senate moved in just Friday. They had a hearing. Uh, Lieberman uh, and his oversight committee uh, talked to Tony Fauci, uh, Ron Paul Keim, and Tom Inglesby, who wrote that letter to the New York Times. And they said, oh, well, can you tell us what's going on here? What are you doing to control this? So I just put all this text so that you can read it at your leisure. Uh, but what I want to show you in particular, here's a little bit about Osterholm, who objected. He aired his concern in a letter to the NIH. That's the letter I, I showed you. Fauci is the head of NIAID at NIH. Uh, he said H5 is one of our research priorities. Um, and the goal is to anticipate what the virus is doing. He noted that a public misconception or misperception arising during the debates that was that the aerosolized virus was lethal to ferrets. That was not the case, he said. So that's what I've been trying to point out to you throughout this. There was an H5N1 paper, interestingly, published in December, which was not reviewed by the NSABB. And this involved transmission of the virus in ferrets. What they did was they selected mutations of the H5HA that allow them to recognize alpha-2,6 uh, receptors. And by the way, the, if you isolate H5 viruses now from nature, they are trending towards using alpha-2,6 receptors. So uh, for some reason that we don't understand, we're select these viruses are being selected in nature. Uh, this virus is transmitted by contact among ferrets, but not by aerosol. But if you put the N2 neuraminidase gene into this virus, so you have an H5, with a couple of mutations in it that allow it to bind receptors. If you put the neuraminidase, a human neuraminidase, it allows partial transmission. So this is what I was telling you before. You have to match the NA with the hemagglutinin and in the receptor specificity. Again, these are not lethal. And this is the citation for uh, this paper. So here is my view, if you don't know it already. <laughs> there will be one question on this lecture on the final. <laughs> Nothing done by well-intentioned scientists is too dangerous to publish. That is my personal view from having seen this go on for 30 years. We're not the ones that do bad stuff. It's the other people that can't be regulated by what we pass here in the US. If you restrict publication, you eliminate serendipity. I can't think of an experiment that would be too dangerous to publish. Maybe you can. Maybe that's a good exam question. I don't know. It impedes us, but not the terrorists. And we're letting fear restrict our progress. I think it's fine to talk about biosafety and what kind of conditions you need to do certain experiments, but don't restrict publication. It doesn't make any sense. That's not how science works. So I wrote about all of this in a paper in mBio. Uh, this is open access. You can go see it. Science should be in the public domain. This is what I feel that science should be always published. And scientists doing the right experiments uh, need to publish their work. OK, so in closing, let me just say a few things. As you know, I record all these lectures. And I put them on iTunes, so you can have them, but the, the world can have them too. Because I want, you see these issues that arise. I think people need to learn about viruses. So a couple of weeks ago, Apple featured our course on iTunes. So um, 
if you go into iTunes U on an iPad or a Mac, um, they cycle through courses and they, they featured us. Look, Columbia <laughs> University. Are. So because of this, it was one week on the front page of iTunes U. Now we have 14,000 people listening to this course. So on their iDevices, 14,000 people. So we have 87 people in the courses here. You can figure out how many years it would take for me to, to teach that many people. So I think this is really great. Um, and those people are listening now. I think it's good that, that we can reach so many people with this technology. Um, the survey is up at CourseWorks. Please fill it out if you have time. It helps us to improve the course. We do take your suggestions. Uh, last year, people said I had too much text on my slides, so I did cut a lot of it out this year. Uh, and if you have suggestions, I'll take them uh, as well. Uh, no office hours this week, but if you want to meet, you can email me and make an appointment, and we can do that. So I hope you've enjoyed the course and you've learned a lot and you can go into the world and be informed citizens about virology. Thank you.